Even prior to the shattering, the children of Radigan and Renala had shown themselves to be extremely ambitious. Rani, for example, would become the mastermind behind the Knight of the Black Knives, sharing the desire to overthrow the gods with her brother Rikard. Yet Rikard would choose a different path from Rani. Instead of stealing the power of death, Rikard would seek to take power by force. Relocating himself to Melt Gelmir, Praetor Rikard would become known as a stern master of vast, blasphemous ambition, with his aim of growing power to overthrow the order of the Erd Tree itself, refusing to accept the rule of grace. His blasphemous philosophy would in turn invite the bloodiest and most desperate conflicts of the Shattering, transforming Mount Gelmir into a corpse-laden wasteland, where horror and desperation are commonplace. As his ambitions grew, they would descend into desperate obsession, and he would feed himself to the great serpent known as Eglae, finding himself abandoned by his once loyal knights in the face of his new abominable form. He would then need to turn to his loyal consort and craft a new breed of warriors in some of the most hideous experiments known to man. Now he is little more than a degenerate beast, influenced by the serpent he has become one with, and he calls the most dissident tarnished to his side. With the recusants at his command, the beast has only one thing in mind, the consumption of the world itself. This is the story of Rikard, the Lord of Blasphemy. Rikard, as you can probably tell from the first consonant of his name, is one of the demigods born of the union of Radigan and Renala. This union, in a way, is the most important marriage in the game. As Muriel says, this marriage represents the union between the House of the Erd Tree and the House of the Moon two of the main contrasting forces in the game. The children of this symbolic union also seem to be the most dynamic, powerful and influential in the events of the game, in my opinion. Rani masterminded one of the most important events in Elden Ring history, the Knight of the Black Knives, and Radan is regarded as one of the most powerful demigods during the Shattering, having mastered the power of gravity, and fought the undefeated Empyrean Melania to a standstill. Rikard himself has garnered a far more sinister and feared reputation, and Ofnir is most likely who the player will first hear his name from. Ofnir describes Praetor Rikard in the following way. Praetor Rikard is the lord of the volcano manor on Mount Gelmir. He is a ruthless justicia who commands a company of inquisitors, reviled for his serpentine demeanour. The volcano, Mount Gelmir, lies in the west of the Altus Plateau, the realm of the Erd Tree. It was the stage of the most appalling battle in the entirety of the Shattering. Rikard has committed the grave sin of blasphemy, marking himself as an enemy never to be forgiven. Now, Praetor is the term that we hear often associated with Rikard, and it gives us the first inkling of what the man stood for. Praetor was a real world position held in ancient Rome both being a military commander and a magistrate who administered law in different ways. This matches up with the other term that Ofnir uses here when he's describing him to us, Justicier. Justicier was also a man of law, a Latin term that is mainly equated with Norman England. Given there are no direct descriptions that pertain to what Rikard was a praetor of, we can assume he was an administrator of law in the age before the Shattering. No doubt he was given this position within the divine hierarchy, not only due to his skills as a stern administrator, but also owed to his divine lineage as Radigan's son and Marika's stepson. Ofnir tells us that he commanded a force of inquisitors, which makes sense for a man focused on enforcing the law, as inquisitors are usually portrayed as an order of ruthless investigators and enforcers. The Inquisition is important to Rikar's development, as he will later incorporate aspects of its tactics into his forces of blasphemy. So let's look at the Inquisition now. Aside from the mention of them from Ofnir, we also get evidence of them from a couple of item descriptions, a Sight of Grace, and a direct encounter with one of them. Both of the items paint a picture of a cruel and violent methodology employed by the servants of Rikard at this time, even before he became the Lord of Blasphemy. Inquisitor Giza invades us if we enter the upstairs area of Volcano Manor. He drops his implement of torture known as Giza's wheel. From the item description, we can see that this wheel weapon would go on to be one of the primary armaments for the Abductor Virgin's weapons, as we can see them on the Abductor Virgins when we fight them later. 
However, from the description we see that this handheld version was the first iteration, meaning that the Inquisition existed prior to the Operator's abduction tools. But don't worry, we will review the iconic abductor virgins later in the video as they are one of my favourite aspects of this lore area. The other inquisitional tool we get sight of is the Inquisitor's Giriandol, which is dropped by the abductor virgins boss fight and it reads the following in its item description. Instrument of torture used on nobles behind the curtain at the volcano manor of Mount Gelmir. Its numerous spikes pierce the flesh then singe the wounds with flame. The smell of burnt blood induces despair in the victim, a candlestick conceived by a thorough mind. This again points to the harsh draconian tactics employed by the servants of Rykard, all under the guise of enforcing the law. It suggests that Rykard would employ torture on nobles through physical pain, but also through psychological torment, a skill that he will refine when he develops a black dumpling device to torture the Albanorix. But as it says in this description, it seems that Rykard was a keen mind at developing new torture tactics that would flay the mind as well as the body. The term behind the curtain suggests that this torture would take place in secret and indeed in the bowels of Volcano Manor we find some chambers that go very deep indeed, all the way down to the Inquisitor's subterranean chamber where no one would hear you scream. Clearly there are two sides of Volcano Manor, the opulent and regal welcoming front of the manor that is full of space for dining, politics and guests. This befits a member of the Erdtree Divine Family. Yet behind the walls and deep below these curated spaces are the dungeons of Rykard, stained with blood and filled with horrific torture contraptions. Indeed, as already mentioned, in the depths of Volcano Manor there is the site of grace called the Subterranean Inquisition Chamber, a hidden room filled with torture devices and cages, suggesting that Rykard's inquisitional men could have been torturing nobles while high society dined in his manor above, completely oblivious of his abuses. The fact that the manor is built this way to hide these chambers suggests that it was built during a time of civility before the shattering. Most of this analysis simply comes from the storytelling of the environment in the Volcano Manor. The position of the chambers far below the curated front of the Volcano Manor as well as the name of the Site of Grace and some of the tools we find from the Inquisition. It highlights the incredible storytelling that From Software does with very little words. I believe that even before he was the Lord of Blasphemy, Praetor Rykor was a ruthless justiciar. He used his position as an enforcer of the law to dispense cruel justice with an iron fist, even torturing people of the noble class, all from the secret interrogation chambers of Volcano Manor. Rykor's heritage of carrying royalty is certainly also not wasted, and indeed his sorcery no doubt contributed to his work later when he began creating his own life forms. However, in the first instance, we can see that he used his heritage to develop a strain of sorcery, the magma spells. For example, let us look at the magma shot's item description. One of these sorceries developed from the magma of Mount Gelmir. Fires a lump of magma that explodes on contact. After discovering the ancient hexes of Gelmir, Rykard, son of Queen Renala, brought them back into practical use as new forms of sorcery. This is interesting because it shows that Rykard obviously was also an able sorcerer, and it also illuminates the fact that he was the one who would create the magma weapons later down the line for his serpent warriors. As mentioned in the introduction to this video, Rykard evidently harboured the same hatred for the gods that his sister did, or at the very least envied the prestige that Marika held as the god over the current order. However, Rykard's moves against the god wouldn't start with the shattering and his path of blasphemy, but in fact we can actually see he was at least tangentially involved in the Knight of the Black Knives, a determination that we can make from the Blasphemous Claw item description which reads as follows. A slab of rock engraved with traces of the Rune of Death. On the night of the dire plot, Rani rewarded Praetor Rykard with these traces. Should the coming trespass one day transpire, they would serve as a last resort foil, allowing Rykard to challenge Malekith the Black Blade, the Black Beast of Destined Death. This means that Rani rewarded Rykard with this tool in case the truth of the Knight of the Black Knives become known that Rani masterminded it, so that Rykard could be the one who's passed the torch so that he could defeat Malekith in a last ditch effort to overthrow the gods. This suggests that Rykard was involved or at very least knew about the plan with Rani who shared it with him, 
Even if he was less involved, it does show that he was connected to the plot of the Knight of the Black Knives. This does make sense given that both he and Rani are proven enemies of the gods and have no love for them. So even before he became the Lord of Blasphemy, he had in secret already acted against them. With all that being said, let us move on to the Shattering, towards the Rikard we know and love in-game. As with most demigods, Rikard claimed a great rune and entered the horrendous war, and it was at no doubt at this stage that he made his blasphemous aims clear. The road of blasphemy is most clearly defined by the description of the Taker's cameo, and the description reads as follows. When Rikard turned to heresy, taking by force became the rule. The gods themselves were no different, after all. Rikard's philosophy was simple. The strong claim what they want from others to grow more powerful themselves. Might makes right. This violent philosophy, while initially attractive to his followers, would lead down a path of utter destruction and consumption. As Bernal says, the path of blasphemy leads only to a pitiful death. The path of blasphemy being those who spit at grace and turn against the Erd Tree, against grace, whilst covering yourself in the blood of others in order to take their power for your own. Indeed, it is his ambition to overthrow the order of the Erd Tree and take the power of others by forces, as noted by one of his former knights, that is the path of blasphemy. And while these were initially lofty and inspiring to some, despite their blasphemous nature, he would one day take the blasphemy too far in an act so horrendous that some of his knights would no longer follow him and in fact act against him. Indeed, when the shattering commenced, like the other demigods, he had soldiers and knights sworn to his command, who were inspired by these ambitions to overthrow the Erd Tree, blasphemous though they were. We can see this from the Gelmir Knight Set chess piece, which reads as follows. Armour worn by knights once loyal to Praetor Rikard, it bears an emblem that none wear any longer, standing as it does for a lord that fell from loft ambition into gluttonous depravity. As the lord lost his dignity, so too did these knights lose their master. No doubt they will have also been proud to follow a son of the legendary warrior Radigan, since we see his knights were wearing the red plume of Radigan's red mane on their helmets. As already hinted at, we do get a direct insight into how those who were loyal to Rikard felt about their lord at this stage. We get this by conversing with a Gelmir knight's ghost who appears in Volcano Manor, decked out in full Gelmir knight uniform. The knight states that despite his blasphemous anti-grace ideals, Rikard's ambitions marked him as a worthy lord, a worthy sovereign. Combined with the description of the knight's armour, and the description of Tanith's armour, the consort set, it seemed that many agreed with his blasphemous ideals and it was only when he allowed himself to be eaten by the snake that people began to abandon him, only leaving Tanith by his side. This would later be seen as a blasphemy too far, too gross, for all but one. Either prior or during the Shattering, but before becoming a serpent, Rikard would meet his most important confidant, Lady Tanith. We know from her armour description she was once a dancer in a foreign land, who he made his consort, and that, even when becoming what he is now, Tanith would remain by his side, and in fact she would become even more infatuated with him when he became the gluttonous serpent. Indeed, we will revisit the Lady Tanith at other points in the video, but for now it is worth bearing that Tanith has been by Rikard's side since he was still in his original form, as the armour set states the fact that she had known him before and then after, and becoming more enchanted with him after he becomes the serpent. The fact that she was a dancer in a foreign land again suggests to me that he met her before the Shattering in peacetime. She would remain at his side at Volcano Manor as the battles raged on Mount Gelmir, right through to the current age where she is the proprietress of the manor and the de facto leader of the recusants, taking Rikar's place as the figurehead of the Volcano Manor forces. Ofnir tells us that Mount Gelmir was the source of the most horrific battles during the Shattering, and this is quite evident from the environment and the storytelling around us at Mount Gelmir. The mountain is littered with countless dead, bodies, fires, broken military encampments, war machines. This is clearly a land stained with the blood of countless warriors. Indeed, reviewing the flags involved, it looks like the battle was a protracted siege between capital forces Erd Tree forces, and Rikard's men. The Sword Memorial on Mount Gelmir tells us the brutal nature of this war. 
It reads, The assault on Volcano Manor. The squalid, the sick, the blasphemous. A wretched, unending war with no glory. It was evidently a war fought tooth and nail for every inch of ground gained. With no glory and horrific conditions where warriors were as likely to die from squalid battlefield conditions as they were from an enemy blade. It reminds me of the trench warfare of World War I, where each side made minimal gains against enemy lines and disease was rampant in the appalling conditions that emerged. We can observe how horrific, protracted and desperate the campaign would have really been by observing what little capital forces remain on Mount Gelmir. Desperate, broken soldiers consume the corpses of their fallen comrades. While deeper still in the mountain, some are so isolated, broken and lost in despair that they have succumbed to the frenzied flame. No doubt Rikard drew the ire of loyalist forces, given his blasphemous ambitions, so it makes sense that there will have been a large effort to have him removed from the doorstep of Lindell. Indeed, a ghost we can listen to amongst the corpses of Mount Gelmir suggests that it is due to Rikard's blasphemous intentions that it became such a bloody battlefield. Geographically speaking, Mount Gelmir would have been an easy defensive position for Gelmir forces, and would no doubt have reaped a bloody toll as the Erd tree forces advanced. This is evidenced by the broken camps and fortifications that lie along the slopes of Mount Gelmir as different defensive positions. While a brutal war was being fought by his loyal knights on the slopes of the mountain, Rikard would dive deeper into his obsession with gaining and growing strength, and go down a very dark path that even his loyal knights would no longer follow. In the shadow of the Volcano Manor lies Prison Town, and in the bowels of the darkest chambers of Volcano Manor and this town, appalling experimentation would take place. I spoke on this in my Godskin video, but I assume no prior knowledge here, but a lot of the story I would be weaving here is told by the environment, item and enemy placement rather than any overt suggestions or dialogue. However, at this juncture, to understand why Rikard's experimentation took him towards serpents, let us look at some of the history and mythology of Mount Gelmir itself. The Serpent God's Curved Sword reads the following. Curved sword fashioned in the image of an ancient serpent deity and tool of a forgotten religion practice on Mount Gelmir. Formerly used to offer up sacrifices, this sword restores HP upon slaying an enemy. So here we have mention of a cult that was dedicated to a serpent god. Gameplay wise, the function of the sword is absorbing HP, so we can assume that the sacrifices offered up to this serpent god with this sword would have granted the strength of the sacrifice to the serpent himself. The absorption of others' power and life force would have been of immediate appeal to Rikard, who wants to claim the strength of others. Indeed, the serpent is often a sign of gluttony, something that eats and devours others. This is slowly moving towards Rikard's new vision of gaining power. We get more mention of this serpent god from the man's serpent ashes, and the description of those reads as follows. It is said that long ago the elder serpent that dwelled on Mount Gelmir devoured a demigod, and the birth of the man serpents followed. So it's clear that there was a great serpent that already dwelled on Mount Gelmir, and it would come to devour Praetor Rikard, and it was worshipped by sacrificial offerings even before Rikard came to be there at Mount Gelmir. This is an ancient sect. I would posit that the name of this great serpent, the one that we see fused with Praetor Rikard, is called Igle. The serpent temple in this area, where the godskin is located, is called the Temple of Igle, and is full of serpent iconography. In fact, if you look closer at the main altar, you can notice more. I once thought this was merely a statue of a great serpent, but upon closer inspection, it appears to be the shed hollow skin of a giant snake, of Igle himself, no doubt seen as the centerpiece and holy relic of this church, dedicated to the elder snake himself. It's clear to me that Rikard established the worship of the serpent here after concluding its power was the best course of action for his goals, possibly even after he became one with the serpent, therefore it would make sense that he would see it as divine. He possibly even saw its power to absorb and consume others as something sacred and holy given it is in line with his own blasphemous ideals. And so encouraging serpent worship among his followers is in his best interest when trying to convince those who follow him that this serpent path is the best path. The serpent hunter weapon, the one that we get given to fight Rikard with, has an interesting item description as well. 
as it gives us an insight into the power and age of this elder serpent Igle. The description reads as follows. Weapon that serves as both a greatsword and a spear, thought to have been used to hunt an immortal great serpent in the distant past. The serpent Igle is clearly immortal and has existed for some time, and its ability to consume and absorb life forces will have clearly been of appeal to Rykard. We all know what happens next, and we see it in the introductory video. Rykard would have found and drawn the Great Serpent to him, and let himself be devoured by it. Great Rune and all. But given his power and his demigod status, he was somehow able to impose his own mind and body onto the Serpent as well, fusing and becoming one being rather than just simply being devoured by the Serpent Eagle. However, the desires of the Serpent itself can be gleaned through the Devourer Scepter, the weapon wielded by Bernal. It reads as follows. Scepter in the shape of a serpent devouring the world. This weapon will one day become the very symbol of the Lord of Blasphemy. A vision of the future briefly seen by Rykard in his final moments before being devoured by the Great Serpent. The Scepter shows the serpent devouring the world as its ultimate desired future. It's clear upon becoming one with the serpent while he was being eaten, Rykard was able to tap in and see the thoughts and desires of the serpent itself, which would have been desiring the world to be eaten. Rykard would begin to incorporate this goal into his own ideals and iconography. Firstly, his blasphemous ideals were to overthrow and take the power of the gods, but now as we meet him later in the game, it is to consume the gods. Who is really in control of this being, the Serpent or Rykard? It's hard to say, but what is clear is that neither is one or the other anymore. They are both Rykard and Eagle. They are the Lord of Blasphemy. The result is something monstrous, a being who wants to consume the very gods, and even the world. The Gelmir Knight's description tells us that it bears the old symbol of Rykard, a symbol that was evidently replaced as the scepter says, this will one day become the symbol of the Lord of Blasphemy itself, the serpent devouring the world. And indeed, another nice detail from From Software, we see this iconography reflected on the banners hanging around Mount Gelmir itself. It shows the Lord of Blasphemy, the serpent of blasphemy, a Rykard serpent hybrid, consuming the world as the new symbol of the Lord of Blasphemy. With his new form and ideology in place, his own knights would turn against him. We have already examined the Knight Gelmir description and dialogue. This was no longer a grand ambition of a man who wanted to change the order of things and become more powerful. No, this was a man who had traded his divine demigod form for that of a gluttonous, depraved snake. The latter half of the item description for the Serpent Hunter shows that his men even began conspiring to kill his new body before he could dishonour his memory any further, and indeed it is one of the knights that places the Serpent Hunter in his chamber that allows us to finally destroy him. So, with his knights turning against him, Rykard would need new warriors. And this is where we return to Rykard's black site, prison town, and the various chambers that reach all the way down to the subterranean Inquisition chamber. Once used for his Inquisition activities, it is clear that prison town has become a place of experimentation to develop a new force a new force that might reflect his new ideals and beliefs. Uh, around the town we see the fruits of this labour, the Man Serpents. Raya's kin and the Man Serpent Ashes tell us that the development of these creatures began after his ascension to the Serpent of Blasphemy. No doubt the Serpent of Blasphemy sees their union of Serpent as Man as something that needs to be replicated in his forces and indeed they are a nice reflection of their lord that they now serve. The present town Guesthouse and other hidden rooms of Volcano Manor tell a story. In the town we see hundreds of deceased victims, piled high and burnt after serving Rykard's forces. Rykard seems to have abducted many Alban Orcs as well, having a real interest in them. As the aptly named Guesthouse is packed with Alban Orcs in various stages of torture. Some have the black dumplings strapped on their heads, meant to drive them to utter insanity, and given their rabid behaviour, one can only conclude that this was successful. Others are experiencing more physical pain, being strapped to racks and torture cages, forcing their legs to disappear. Yet why this interest in Alban Oryx? 
Well, again, as I discussed in my Goskins video, all Bonorics are artificial lifeforms created by the hand of man. We can see this from the description of the Albanoric blood clot, which reads, Albanorics are lifeforms created by human hands. Thus, many believe them to live impure lives, untouched by the Ard Tree's grace. My assumption is that Rykar's interest in these beings is from that they are created. He is no doubt trying to uncover the truth behind creating new lifeforms himself, or at least how to alter existing lifeforms by using the secrets of Albanoric creations. He does this by pushing them to their mental and physical limits, peeling them apart layer by layer to discover the secrets in their blood. Let us once again turn to the Godskin Noble that we find here. Again, I go into this in far more detail in my Godskin video, so I'll leave a link for that below. But in short, I believe that the Godskin Noble is allied with Rykard for mutual benefit. I believe that Rykard seeks to benefit from the Godskin's knowledge of moulding in human bodies. The Godskin Noble set states the following. Nobles are the most ancient apostles who are said to have assimilated in human physiology, not unlike the crucible, the earth tree in its primordial form. In that video I mentioned, it was obviously in reference to the inhuman tale that they had gained and incorporated into their own human-like body. In that time, I said that it was like dragon physiology. However, upon reviewing the comments from that video, a viewer, Filippo Opi, pointed out that these are more like serpent tails. And upon reflection, I would actually agree. The underbelly segmentation of the tail certainly suggests it looks like a serpent tail. And more importantly, we find this godskin noble in a location heavily associated with snake-human hybridization. So it would make sense to call in an expert in this type of crossbreeding as well as the fact that both make natural allies with each other. They both want to see the end of the gods. In return, the godskin noble receives a fresh supply of skin from the constant influx of prisoners, as well as assisting Rykard in completing the objective of destroying the gods, which is his objective too. The Raya storyline gives us an insight into where this horrific experimentation finally leads, and how the serpent men became to be. Once we discover the secret labs behind the noble facade of the manor, Raya asks us to let us know if we find anything pertaining to our birth, because at this stage she's beginning to suspect that this secret side of the manor that was being hidden from her must have something to do with her serpentine form. Indeed, after we defeat the godskin noble at the Temple of Iglae, we find a new item, the Serpent's Amnion. The item description for this reads as follows. Amnion from the mother's womb, which cradled the poor unwanted offspring of a repellent birthing ritual. The Amnion is a fluid-filled sac that encloses the embryo during fetal development, and Raya is certain that this once held her after she smells it and we give her it. The description hints at a dark crossbreeding ritual, and this is confirmed by Raya herself after she does her own digging in the secret parts of the manor. She was born of a hideous ritual something so reviled that it can never be accepted by men or serpents. We get the heredious implications of what this was when Raya leaves her final item, either by killing her or by leaving. Dedekar's Woe. The item description reads as follows. Disturbing likeness of a woman whose skin was flayed. She smiles with a serene tenderness. It is said that this woman, named Dedeka, indulged in every form of adultery and wicked pleasure imaginable giving birth to a myriad of grotesque children. For me, the implications of this item are clear and you don't even need to read between the lines too hard. Daedekar is her real mother. The item description implies that Raya and the other serpents were born of a hideous mating ritual between men and snake, before Daedekar was left to the mercies of the godskin, who flayed her after she had been used up. I believe the race of snake men came into being this way, Dedekar may have been the mother to the first batch, or just Raya herself, but I believe she is a typical example of what was used to create these serpent men. These are the perfect soldiers for Rykard, his children, a reflection of his own depraved form. He would then arm these with weapons infused with magma magic, a derivation from Rykard's work with magma spells that we looked at earlier. This is a fearsome force indeed, and certainly a force that would have no objections to his new serpentine form and is a perfect reflection of his new ideology. It would have been during this period of serpent hybridization development that Rykard will have commissioned the Abductor Virgins, my favourite enemy design in the entire game. Why? 
because their design is so perfect and is a combination of all the different facets of Rikard's work, culminating in this perfect tool that is a reflection of his new form as the Lord and Serpent of Blasphemy. So let's look at it. We know that he already incorporated the tools of his Inquisition into their weaponry, making them not only tools for abduction, but incredible weapons of war. This is like a tank being introduced into our World War I myth for earlier, and they would have absolutely ruled over and cleaned up any loyalist forces remaining on Mount Gelmir. Indeed, we see the Virgin slaughtering the base clamp of Mount Gelmir when we first arrive in the region. Now let's consider the design of the Virgins in the aesthetic sense, for they are representative of Rikar's new belief system, and we can see them coming into existence after he become the Serpent, due to their very clear iconography which allows us to place them in Rikard's timeline. Most obviously they are wreathed in golden snakes, and even the snatching vines that come from their inner compartment are actually snakes if you look carefully. Next we see they are also cradling a baby. To me this is symbolic of Rikard seeing as the serpent men as his children, and this is more conclusive if you consider the birthing of Raya during her quest as the serpent men are actually literally born into the world as children are. All in all, the abductor virgin's designs are superb, the peak of Rikar's creation, powerful weapons, useful abductors, and fully symbolic of all that he stands for. We're going to move on to a bit of speculation here for what lore video would be complete without it. For me, the serpent men were not the only life form that Rikar created. I believe that he created the Finger Creepers, or Finger Spiders. Let's start by looking at these enemies in the appearance way. They have a purplish hue and are covered in many ornate rings. Now let's take a quick glance at the Lord of Blasphemy's hand. Yes, it's very near the knuckle, isn't it? How they look so similar to his hand, adorned with the ornate kind of rings that he has as well. Next, let us consider also where we find these enemies in the game. We mainly find them, we find them other places, but we mainly find them at Carrion Manor and Mount Gelmir, both locations associated with Rikard and his family. In fact, these are the places where we find Rikard and his old ally and sister, Rani. Most conclusively, however, for me, is the ringed finger item description. Again, this looks like a finger that has been taken from a being that looks like a finger creeper and it looks both like Rikar's finger and a finger creeper simultaneously. But most important is the words and semantics used in the description, which reads as follows. Bludgeon made of an enormous finger, sheathed in several heavy rings, thought to have been cut from an ancestor of the finger creeper. Some life yet remains in this legacy of an ancient act of blasphemy as evidenced by the barely perceptible warmth it still exudes. The term blasphemy is so clearly used here, and in these games, no word is just placed there by chance. To me, it immediately looks like we're supposed to be referring to Rikard, Lord of Blasphemy, given he is the one being that is associated with the term blasphemy in this universe. Again, it also emphasizes the fact that it is sheathed in heavy rings, drawing the attention to the fact that it has the rings that are very similar to Rikard's ringed serpentine finger. My conclusion? After taking his serpent form and he's having these huge, big purple hands that look very much like the finger creepers, he somehow created these beings from cutting off a finger or creating them from his hand. The exact details behind it aren't clear to me, and if I've missed something lore-wise when it comes to these finger creepers, please let me know in the comments below because I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. But if I was to guess, given this finger looks like it's cut off, and it's linked to a act of blasphemy, I would say that after he became the serpent he cut off a finger and somehow used his carrion magic to create a race of finger creatures from it as another new tool. Again, this is all conjecture, but the look of Rikard's hand, the finger, and the finger creepers themselves are so clearly linked and then just tied together with a nice little bow of the word blasphemy makes it pretty clear that these are linked to Rikard, in my opinion. Okay, you can take your tinfoil hats off now. There's another facet of Rikard's followers we must still discuss. The recusants of Volcano Manor. The family of champions. And I feel Barnal, the most committed recusant out of them all, can describe the organization's aims better than I. The strong take. Such is our code. 
but know that the path you walk is blasphemy and leads only to a miserable death. Before you consider hunting any of your own kind, think on that. The recusants, as their name would suggest, see themselves as rebels who disavow their preordained role as servants of grace and the two fingers. And in fairness to them, while they glorify it as a rebellious clause, neither do they hide the fact that it is a tainted path filled with the blood of their kin. The recusants hunt down the tarnished who still serve the grace, or at least refuse the manor's invitation to join. Represented in-game by PvP invasions, and the missions we are given by the manor to hunt down NPCs. This is both an act of rebellion against the Fingers by striking down their servants, and it is part of the Taker's Maxim that is exemplified by Rikard and his followers, and is shown in the Taker's Cameo item description. It is taking the power of others by killing them and taking what you want. The strong claim what they need from the weak. This taking and growing of strength has one goal in mind, a full rebellion against the Erdtree Tree and the order that it stands for. Bernal again exemplifies these ideals in his words. But any road, the Volcano Manor is no more. Though we may yet fulfill an old promise. We hunted our own kind and took what was theirs. And with everything in hand, the time has come to rise against the Erd Tree. O oh, greater will, hear my voice. I am the recusant Bernal. Inheritor of my brother's will. And you will fall to my blade. We refuse to become your pawns. Consider this fair warning. Yet in reality, the recusants have their own personal reasons for serving the Lord of Blasphemy. For Patches, it is convenient as he prefers a world free from authority, and he likes just being contrary. For Dialos, it is a desperate chance to prove himself against the legacy of his more talented older brother. For Banal, even the most dedicated and exemplary recusant has his own reasons. If we read his armour description, it we then learn that he was on the path to become a lord, that he was a real fearsome champion that was proving himself to be Elden Lord, yet his maiden killed himself scuppering his chance at power within the Elden Pantheon. No doubt this would make him feel bitter and cheated, and so it is to little surprise that he now raises his sword against the Erd Tree in anguish. It is Raya's job as the Manor Scout to identify powerful Tarnished, who may well be swayed with the promise of power and glory along the path of champions. However, make no mistake, despite the Manor's honesty when it comes to the taint and bloodshed of their path, they glorify it to an extreme degree to attract powerful tarnished to their cause, people who feel disassociated with the Order of Grace. Again they hide the dark side of the manor and paint their cause as one of rebellion and necessary bloodshed and dress it up as the so-called Path of Champions, proud rebels who refuse to be pawns of the Archery Order. And yet in buying into this, recusants may very well become the pawns of Tanith and Rikard. Because the real aim of the recusants, under Tanith's direction, is to hone them and groom them into their most peak form, as they take the power of others. And it is at this point, when they are at their absolute peak, when Lady Tanith decides, when they see a champion is ready, they will meet with the legendary Lord Rikard, that who they have really been serving. An exciting prospect to meet a demigod, and one worth aspiring to and these champions must feel like they are worthy of doing so given the tasks they have had to go through and the power that they have gained. Yet, instead of being granted the laurels they no doubt expect when they meet their lord, they are instead greeted with a grotesque meld of two beings, and Rikard consumes them so that they too become one with the serpent. This process is described by Rikard's rancor which reads the following. These spirits manifest from the rancor of heroes who met a violent end. The Lord granted them an audience, whereupon they were welcomed by the maw of the Great Serpent, and within the Serpent's bowels, they became the Lord's kin. Riker does himself spell this out for us when we receive our audience. He says, Join the Serpent King. As family, together we will devour the very gods. 
This is the true family of champions we read about in our initial invitation to the banner. A family of cursed beings all tied to the body and the blood of the Serpent of Blasphemy. The remembrance of the Blasphemous explains that Rikard became the Serpent so he might devour and grow. To me it's clear that Rikard literally absorbs the others into his beings in order to add their power to his own. And we can see him unleashing his considerable power in our fight with him, where he unleashes the bitter souls of those he has devoured and then channels their immense power through his sword in an awesome display of power. We can see that these people attached to him are not only part of him but also still alive and suffering. We see their writhing forms along the blasphemous blade and coming out from his body. It's not exactly groundbreaking lore but a nice detail is that the blasphemous blade is obviously the sword that Rikard once wielded as a man. It has the same hilt as the one in the painting of Rikard. And to me it shows that the blade has just become so infused with commingled blood and remains of Rikard's family that it is just almost unrecognisable and that it is probably also part of the one being. When he devours a champion they literally commingle their blood and body with that of the serpent becoming part of the greater whole. The blasphemous sword description makes it clear that those devoured become kin to this process, part of the body and assuming from Rikard's rancor the fact they are bitter assumes to me that despite the fact they have become one with Rikard's body with their power being able to be channeled by him at his command they still retain their consciousness, and that's just a horrible, horrible thought. No wonder they are so bitter. Yet he makes his final mistake in trying to absorb us when he grants an audience to us. Fulfilling the wishes of his loyal knights, we pick up the Serpent Hunter and stop the demigod from falling further into his own degradation by wielding the ancient Serpent Hunter of old, killing Igle and Rikard within. The story of Rikard is one of a man with lofty ambitions crossing the line into dangerous obsession to a point where he's so consumed by the desire to grow stronger that he never actually achieves anything, he never achieves his actual original goal. He gets so lost and addicted to the process of gaining power to the point where it means it matters more than the actual end result of what he was setting out to do, which was of course to destroy the gods. He just got more caught up in absorbing power rather than actually using that power to direct it against his enemies. As he sullied his own flesh in a desire for greater power, his once loyal soldiers could no longer stomach following him. Only one would remain by his side, to the end, Lady Tanith, his consort. Even seeing him fail in his own self-concocted philosophy and proving himself too weak by his own mantra, she still loves her lord. And tragically we find her consuming Rikard's innards in a desperate and insane plot to becoming some ghoulish amalgam where she will host Rikard's mind and body inside of her rather than the serpent that did it before. This, everyone, is where the path of the champions leads. This is where the Taker's Mantra leads. A pathetic scene, a fallen demigod too twisted and absorbed to even see through his own plans, being eaten at one handful at a time by the only human that was ever truly loyal to him. So thanks guys, that is my video on Rikard, the Lord of Blasphemy. And boy oh boy did this video really get away from me from four, over 40 minutes. I, I thought this one actually would be shorter than the one I did last week. But there you have it, it shows how much detail there is. And to be honest I could have gone even further into this one if I had gone into the symbolism of serpents. But I thought <laughs> there was a, a time to stop this video. Um, lest I get lost in my own process much as Riker did. If you like this video then please uh, you know, give me a like as it helps get the video out there and consider subscribing as I do obviously do lore videos and I'm going to be continuing to cover Elden Ring as much as I can. Um, and if you have any thoughts about what I've discussed, if you think I'm wrong on some bits, please let me know below. Last time people commenting on my video really helped me develop this video so I really appreciate it when people point out things I've missed or where they think I'm wrong. But until next time guys, I hope you have a nice day and I will see you on the bloody battlefields of Mount Gelmir. Take care.